tried that. I have tried this. Okay, uh, okay, let me just check it's recording. Yeah, it is recording. All right. Okay, so hi all of you. It's so good to see uh, you guys here. Um, so we've just uh, decided to have some kind of an informal chat with all of you regarding Fulbright uh, and how to apply for Fulbright. I had circulated a Google form uh, and I got a lot of questions uh, from that Google form. So I've just decided that for the first um, maybe 10 minutes, I'll just uh, uh, show you through the uh, what is Fulbright, why do you apply for it and what is the application procedure and uh, what, are the what are certain things which you could keep in mind in order to have a strong, uh, uh, a strong Fulbright application. So I'll just uh, begin. So basically Fulbright scholarships, uh, Fulbright, okay, so Fulbright is again, it's kind of, they have a lot of fellowships. So one is Fulbright Nehru Doctoral Research Grant. Uh, this is the particular grant for which uh, we have been selected, Susan, Nivida, Angarika, I, and Abhigya. So this is basically if you're enrolled already at uh, a PhD, for a PhD course at an Indian institute, then you can apply for these and you could spend from like six to nine months at a US university of your choice. Uh, now there are certain other grants similar to Fulbright. So Fulbright is for the US. Uh, for uh, the UK, you have the Commonwealth. Again, Commonwealth has a lot of grants. So Commonwealth Split Site Fellowship is the one which is similar to the Fulbright grant where you could spend 12 months either at a stretch or you could split your award into two periods of six months study uh, to study at a UK institute. Similarly, DAAD is something for Germany. Shastri grant is for Canada. Uh, then Charles Wallace and Newton Bhaba are also for the UK. And there used to be something called, called the Endeavour grant for Australia, but I, it seems that they've scrapped it or they are planning to change it. So I'm not pretty sure. Apart from these, the, most of these universities do have visiting positions, but it's just that they don't, uh, they don't fund it. Uh, Angarika, you wanted to say something? Yeah. So for uh, economics or development, there's also a World Bank yeah. fellowship on which Satisha went. Uh, that is also, I think, six to six months, and you can extend it after that. And that's for anywhere in the world, US or UK, any university. Yeah, yeah. thanks for adding that. Um, so, okay, people are also asked whether there is some application fees uh, when you are applying for these fellowships. So, there is no application fees. You just have to prepare your application and upload it on the portal or email, whatever is required in the application. Uh, so basically, uh, okay, so I'll begin with a very, uh, very basic thing. So eligibility I've already told you about. So what's the process? So in the Fulbright, you have an application process where you first uh, send your responses or upload your responses on their system, and then there is an interview. So you have written responses which you send them, which primarily consists of your statement of purpose or your research objective. Then you have your personal statement, you have one writing sample, and then you have recommendation letters, at least, I think one from your supervisor and two from uh, uh, some other faculty members. It could be, usually it should be one from your institute and one from another institute. Although both could also be from the same institute, it depends upon you. Um, uh, okay, so that's broadly the process. Apart from this, um, yeah. Okay, also before going into the selection criteria, some of you had also asked how do you find an appropriate institution and how do you contact your host supervisor. So actually you do not con uh, contact the host university, you contact the host supervisor and it is the supervisor who then generates a letter of support which we might be just stating you know that um, everyone in my department is okay like this was exactly the letter i'm telling you what my host supervisor had written that my department is okay with hosting this person from this to this period on a fulbright grant so that's all that's all now how do you contact the person again it depends upon you in my case i already had taken a gyan course with that particular person and so it was easier for me to contact him because I had also met him like at least one to two times when he was in India. Other cases what you could do is that you are of course reading a lot of scholars and following a lot of people when you're reading, when you're doing your own research, your own uh, dissertation writing. So you could maybe identify who are the people who are there in the US and who would be the best people who could uh, just guide you during your uh, Fulbright or could just maybe host you and willing to host you and then you can try to write an email to them. 
Now my suggestion is that do not write them the very first time that you you want them to support you uh, for a full ride unless you are introduced to them say by a supervisor or some other professor because this is from my experience they usually do not entertain such behaviors people might have different experiences but this is something from my experience you can maybe just try to engage with their work a bit and just email them okay i have i just read this that's what i did uh, for a different thing and then the person responded and then i asked the person that would you be willing to and then the person was like okay so that is one thing from my experience again it may vary uh, uh, from different people um so yeah that th- those are a few uh, ways i also try to uh, kind of find out who are the best people and uh, what is the place which would give me the maximum exposure to maximum universities and maximum people that was also another criteria which helped me to decide whom uh, should i put on my first preference second preference third preference accordingly then uh, someone had also asked whether publications strengthen your application well it is a good thing to have your have a few publications if you have it's a good thing but that is not a selection a central selection criteria so it's okay even if you do not have any publications what matters is who you are as a person and what your research is and why do you want to go to the us that is something they really want to know that is something they'll keep asking you again and again during your interview as well and uh, another person had also asked what stage of my phd should i apply again that's i think something for you to decide and maybe your supervisor might help might help you in deciding um in my case i i decided applying for it later because i was not really aware of it at the very first place in my initial years also i wasn't quite uh, confident of applying because my work was not at a very advanced stage so i decided to apply after my comprehensive because my work was pretty much at an advanced stage and i knew why where i want to go and how i will benefit from that place so that was something uh, okay now i'll just tell I, I just want to add something that yeah, you can't yeah. apply if you are still doing your coursework. So that you have to. I mean, that is not up to you. That is given. That uh, coursework has. To, in fact, uh, even your comprehensive would yes. have to be completed yes. by the time you are going because uh, you should be at a stage where you are at in a research only yes. mode yes. in your university, and also the application takes one year. basically so the year yes. that you apply you will only be able to go the next year yes. and the year after that for a year yes. so you have a very small window to apply maybe once or twice actually yes. and uh, also another thing is if whenever you apply and you are going you will for that period you will lose your indian fellowship uh, whatever it is either iit or jrf so it's yes. not like that will be that period 9 months will be added later because some people had asked me if this happens yeah. and this does not happen so if you want you can actually go towards the if you want to extend fellowship yeah. you can also think of applying later when you are going at your fifth year yes thanks for pointing that out, out andrika that is something i missed out also as far as i recall there is also one criteria that you should be within the fi- within 5 years of your phd i do not know if they are a little relaxed about it right now because things have changed because of the pandemic and people's research have been affected but that is also something that i recall um okay yeah, i think uh, sanya that criteria is that you should have time to finish like 3 months yes yes after you come back yes to submit your phd yes so it couldn't be that you are uh, coming back at a stage when you don't have 3 months left yes. that's like the general criteria but i think for iit it's not 5 years because our enrollment is it's valid for 7 Seven. years 5 years is only for fellowship yes. so as long as you have 3 months left in that 7 years you can go because officially you are still enrolled yeah thanks thanks andrika okay now i'll just uh, i'll just begin uh, speaking about uh, what is it what are the selection criteria of fulbright and what are the things that uh, you could take care of while you are applying for not just fulbright but also in general any other fellowship in my experience first i'll tell you a very very basic thing whenever you are applying for any fellowship agency you should try to make sure to try to you know kind of figure out what is the their mission what is their you know aim behind funding you why are they interested in funding you at all 
they might have certain goals in mind and if you could try to you know extract those goals from their website um, or whatever their page is it will be very easier for you to kind of craft your application accordingly and try to reflect in your application that somehow you can fit into those goals and their future aims and objectives so for example commonwealth fellowships are very development oriented they want you to kind of you know contribute to some kind of sustainable development goals similarly fulbright wants you to kind of um, uh, somehow they want to encourage leader development and encourage mu mutual understanding between people which is why they focus a lot on educational and cultural exchange okay before that just one more thing before i forget uh, someone had also asked and this was a doubt which, which i also had when you look at the website of fulbright they have very specific categories okay of fellowship so i am from philosophy but there was no category of philosophy so then how did i apply i kind of i i chose the category gender gender um, it's called i think women and gender something of that sort so it doesn't matter if your discipline is uh, different as long as you can fit in your research with one category it is okay uh, i did not choose and and then it is important for you to choose your category wisely because then your application is going to compete within other applications of that specific category so so that is why it was important for me that is why i did not choose anthropology but gender studies to be a little more specific because uh, my research is oriented towards that so uh, it's it doesn't matter if your discipline is basically not uh, you know mentioned over there now what exactly the fulbright commission is looking for in a candidate what they keep on mentioning again and again on their website or if they have certain workshops they keep telling you that they are looking for change agents people who are passionate to bring change in society so basically your application should reflect how uh, whatever you have learned you're going to implement that when you come back to your country so never ever speak in your interview i love the united states and i want to eventually settle down in the united states that's going to really cancel out your application never ever write that or never ever mention that in your interview because the very motive of their fellowship is that you go to the us you get some training which is not available over here in your country and you should explicitly state this in your application what is the training for which you want to go over there and how that training is going to benefit not just your research but your home country how that's going to have some kind of an impact now impact doesn't mean that you're going to you know help in the implementation of some breakthrough policy it can be something very very simple something like you know maybe changing the way um you know your discipline is taught at central universities that is something that i had mentioned in my application so you can have different it can be something very small but it has to be realistic it shouldn't be something which is not achievable so do not like mention something which is undoable that is one thing second thing which they keep emphasizing a lot is that they want people to be cultural ambassadors now what do they mean by educational and cultural ambassadors they want some kind of cultural exchange to happen between people and uh, so basically they want someone who can take their culture to the us and who is open to you open to learn us culture as well and it could be a very small thing it could be just you know maybe watching some shows you have had some particular perspective about the us and you would want to learn something more about it maybe you would want to know uh, share food with people uh, it could be something very simple as that it doesn't have to be something like you know you are a classical trained classical dancer and only then you can be a cultural ambassador that is not how it is that is how i used to think and i used to find this cultural ambassador thing very very intimidating but that's not how it is it can it could be something very small and nicely articulated in your application um so so these are some things which should be these are like main things apart from there their selection criteria is they're looking for academic credentials of course they're looking for your professional ability they're looking for the merit of your fulbright project now what does that mean they want to see what will be the outcomes of your project and what will be the potential impact and benefit of your project and how motivated you are how serious you are for the purpose that you are pursuing uh, whether you have uh, you know leadership uh, skills whether you have cultural adaptability on this cultural adaptability i can just share something while i was reading how to be you know good in your interviews uh, sometimes they can ask you some a very awkward question just to see how you are going to respond 
to that question because ultimately you are going to be a cultural ambassador over there and someone might ask you a very awkward question and so you, so you shouldn't be defensive you should be someone who should try to you know address that question in a very calm mind so these are like very small things they try to look at when they are when you go for your interview then they also okay i told you ability to contribute as a cultural ambassador one thing you're not just going to one particular university but you're going to the us in its entirety so which is why you should uh, demonstrate that you are very open minded you are very flexible in pursuing your goals and your study and uh, this is something which they have mentioned on their website there should be commitment to community and national service so again as i said that that's something which they take very seri- seriously that why why you when you're coming back to india what is it that you're going to you know do with your uh, knowledge because remember the fulbright nehru doctoral research grants are funded partly by the us government and partly by the indian government so it's both of them who are funding it together and your project should uh, reflect enduring concerns it should emphasize basic subjects it should demonstrate sound methodology it should this is very important again avoid politicization of scholarly inquiry this is also something which they have mentioned so uh, in my application for example i really avoided criticizing maybe any particular political party or anything i just i just avoided i just did not want to take any risk and uh, how your project will benefit from the host country's strengths is something which they are really going to ask you and which they which your application should really applic- app, uh, you know reflect that why going to the us is important why going there is important why you cannot do that over here and then they all they would also want you to be a person who has the potential to share your experience and knowledge with others and someone who's you know encouraging cooperative efforts and ties with them and open to host cultures so also do some kind of research of you know or you know what are the kind of resources available in your home country in your home country so just in case they ask you a question ask you a question you are prepared make sure you don't have to be the best just keep in mind you have to be the most prepared that is what is important and um, yeah so fulbright's funding agency it's basically something called the eca which funds uh, it's the us ief and their mission is you know increasing mutual understanding between people of us and other countries through educational and cultural um exchange which assists in development of peaceful relations and they want to encourage leadership development they want to encourage also traditionally underrepresented uh, underrepresented groups and uh, they want you know people who have a passion for change and at the same time they have adaptability and they are flexible to you know pursue their project and they sh- they are expected to bring home whatever they are learned from the host university and then reach out to home communities so uh, during the interview some some things which they uh, really look at you the some the certain criterion which they really look at to judge you is whether you can adjust successfully to life in the us whether you are a representative a representative responsible citizen who can you know contribute to a fair picture of your own country whether you will you know co- contribute to a mutual understanding between people so those were just a few points so basically it boils down to two things you know you have to be kind of motivated to have you know some kind of to be a passionate change agent to be you know sincere in your pursuit so uh, in your application make sure that it should be very clear it should be clear in a way that even a layman can understand whatever you have tried to write and if you see their you know research objective and personal statement they have a question they have posted a question they want so make sure that you respond to each and every part of that question because that is very important you have limited words what you are putting in out there might be very good but you have to always ask yourself is that relevant for the committee is that relevant for this scholarship or you know this particular application that is something which you should keep asking yourself and uh, and uh, yeah and yeah that was just uh, the basic things and whenever of course and during your interview make sure that you do not say anything different from your application everything has to be very consistent and from uh, my experience i can tell you that they are going to primarily ask you questions from your research proposal they are literally going to pick up each line and throw that at you why have you written this why have you written that so you will have to be very prepared to tell them why you have written that and the reasoning you give uh, is very important because they are trying to look at the logic of your responses and uh, yeah and and another thing which they'll keep asking you again and again is why the us ultimately why do you want to apply over there 
and uh, just one tip which I used in my personal statement was that I just uh, wrote everything from scratch in my first draft, like from my bachelor's, all the good experiences that I've had, and then and then after writing that out, after everything is out, then I try to edit and see what are the two three details which I could just pick up from that, and then elaborate more on that because you have to be more specific. So instead of writing something like you know I have I'm very good at handling social media handles, say for example, and running campaigns, that's a very general statement. Instead of that, try to write that uh, maybe I um, uh, I have been I maybe I know how to effectively handle social social media handles. For example, I ran this campaign. Uh, for for this particular purpose and uh, it maybe had say 600 viewers or 600 people who came in support or something of that sort like try to make it as quantitative as possible that is also something because then that helps you in making it very specific so it's important for you to make it specific that's all that I had to say I think I'll just uh, uh, leave it to maybe uh, Angarika, Abhigya, Nirida and Susan if they would want to share their experiences and then we can just have a uh, chat with everyone. Maybe. Uh, I can add on to what uh, Sanya was saying. Uh, one thing I was thinking, I don't know, maybe Nirida will also be able to say this better, that uh, in terms of not being political, I think Fulbright is kind of political. So, it, it, I mean, it, you don't have to force yourself to be neutral. If your uh, like research or your viewpoint or perspective in research is a political angle, you don't need to neutralize that. It's okay to keep that angle and uh, speak back. I mean, what happens is if you're trying to neutralize political perspectives in, in your research or what you want to do, then it becomes less passionate when you're speaking about it in interview, you're trying to choose a middle path. I think it's better to uh, stick to what, even if that's, you know, somewhat uh, problematic in India, I think uh, the, the political uh, perspective of Fulbright is more open. You can say that even for cultural uh, uh, exchange and all this, like, well, why do you want to go to US? You could give political reasons for that. That I, see, we were come, we would have come at a time when the, the US could uh, have its elections. So it's it's also okay to say that I want to experience that. Mm -hmm. You know, partly, not not the entire reason. But because I mean, there are people I know who are working on political science and are giving these reasons. So if your thesis is something which has to do a lot with, with elections, politics, or even a general ideological perspective, which is political, I don't think there's need to unnecessarily screen it that I don't have this perspective. Uh, obviously, no, not needed. I mean, there's no need to go overboard and <laughs> use it as a campaign. But I'm just saying that sometimes like research can also have a perspective which is political and it's okay to have that in uh, full right and um, what were you saying at the end oh about personal statement uh, uh, like that that's one like i think that's how sanya did it writing everything down and choosing it uh, that's a new way i think i i i heard it for the first time uh, and it worked so that's good but i i did it in a completely different way so i thought i will also share that uh, I was trying to build a story, so you could also think of your experiences like that uh, from, I mean, whatever this 25, 30 years of journey that you have, after which you are doing a PhD. So how, how have things in your life from childhood to now mm -hmm. added up to, uh, I mean, how do they add up to form a story which ends at this, at pursuing this PhD right now? Mm -hmm. That is how I have uh, written it so that's also something you could think of if, if your, how your PhD topic is related to how you have uh, grown as a person uh, over time so yeah just that yes. can I pop in sure okay so I think um, about the political thing I think if your topic is political, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I think, Sanya, what you were trying to say is don't overly politicize something. Don't... Yes, yes. That's yeah. what was exactly my Yeah. Point. Because I had a lot of colleagues who... Mm -hmm. Paddy politics right and that mm -hmm. was okay. Mm -hmm. 
so i think like angarika i think the last thing that you said is i don't go on a campaign i think that's really the point yeah that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay about applications and after this um, whatever else comes up a couple of things i did a little bit differently by the way sanya can i just say this is the most comprehensive and accurate presentation i have attended on any topic like Thanks. this was brilliant i don't think you've left a single stone unturned if anybody follows you to the t i have no doubt they'll get it it was so spot on from the minute details to the larger approach bravo man it was brilliant like you're making me wish ne koi mere time kitni hota main to bahut ro ro ke i cried so much while writing my application it was so hard thank you um it's brilliant um i would just add something that professor nair told me when i was putting my application together don't pander to them don't pander to anyone stick by your pro- it's not to say not to follow the goals of what they want this is not to do that this is this is simply to say that, that don't um belittle in a way your project and your immense work by saying that fulbright ke liye ho raha hai commonwealth ke liye ho raha hai like that is the be all and end all of your work it is one of the things that you're considering as you continue to pursue the importance of your own topic so if that passion can somehow come through um which i think again angarka what you said about like story in your life i i followed the same approach to show how um because i'm i'm i approached it from a psych- i fell under psychology but again psychology was not an available topic so i applied under public health but my topic was really personal is the emotional abuse of children so there's absolutely no way that i can stand by my project if i I felt that I could not support my own project if I was super theoretical and objective and cutthroat about it. So it's completely an emotional piece, mm. and it it worked. On the other hand, Sanya, as you were saying, they took my research proposal apart. Why are your uh, references only foreign? What about Indian references? Are they any? So, <laughs> um, and that became a point of entry for conversation because I was like, if you let me go, I can become one of those Indian voices that you're hoping to see on my current presentation. So. what you said about backing your work and knowing your research proposal inside out was really spot on mm. so yeah I, i would just add that and then um if any other questions are there maybe we can all take them uh, before proceeding uh, could all of you share uh, which was your host institute okay i okay i haven't yet received a confirmation of affiliation but my host university has confirmed but i haven't yet officially rece- received it from the fulbright commission so i'll be going to columbia university i am at umass amherst i went to nyu thanks susan abhigya you could also maybe just i will just try to connect my internet is a bit choppy Uh, so i'll be uh, going to the harvard kennedy school of public policy or the department of uh, science and technology studies um i'll be going to ucsc and i just want to add on to what sanya and nivita were saying um about a few things um you know it it's it sounds very intimidating when uh, you read the application and there's all this focus on driving the change and being this kind of um you know big personality and uh, i i felt that in retrospect that uh, the focus is more on your project proposal because you know there's going to be a lot of qualities that can be shared such as mm-hmm. driving change and being a virtuous person and so on but what's going to be different about each application is the project proposal and its uniqueness so i think that's certainly um, matters a lot and uh, one more thing that you know we have to keep in mind is that the application is going to uh, have this project proposal and this personal statement and that's what they're going to this lengthy application and that's what you're going to be evaluated on um and the interview that happens much later it's only about uh, 15 20 25 minutes at most and it, you know that's when they really need you and talk to you and see uh, what kind of a person you are and whether you know, you can hold a conversation about your yeah. project 
and uh, and even if you think and i think this is very important because you may think that your project may not fit the fulbright uh, grand objectives or that your project is too much in a niche area to matter to people or anything like that you have to remember that whatever field you're applying in there there's going to be experts from that field who are going to be there to interview um so let's say in anthropology or psychology or public health or anything like that there's going to be assistant professors um other experts in that area so even if you feel like you know you're going to be you're not going to be able to speak much about why you want to go to the US or what kind of difference you're going to make and all these big questions you can still engage with the experts if you have a strong mm-hmm. proposal I'll just add a small uh, yeah. things over here. Yeah, one is about something adding to what Nirida and Angarika had said. That yes, be passionate about uh, whatever you are writing. I mean, of course, you are passionate about your project. It's very important to be truthful rather than you know trying to fabricate or something because they'll immediately catch you in the interview. They will immediately. They are like kind of experts. Uh, sm- something very small experience which just reminds me from what just Susan said. I remember that one of the panelists whose name I immediately saw. Uh, while I just logged in, it was online because of the pandemic. Uh, she was like one of the leading experts in my area, an Indian, and I had never contacted her. Despite my supervisor kept telling me a lot of times long back that you should actually talk to her. That made me very nervous, very very nervous, and I was actually very nervous. But then eventually I was at peace. And another very important piece of information: I was on the waiting list. So the first time I was shortlisted, and I, I was so sad because I I had worked so hard for it. but um, they require you to g- take this toefl exam the english proficiency exam if you take that only then they'll consider your application whatever so i anyway took it i i really did not want to write at that exam i did not score very well in that exam uh, as well but eventually after a few months i got to know that my status has been uh, you know uh, whatever i have been a principal candidate because of lack of funds they had initially chosen maybe very few people and then later finally and oh, very recently there's one more candidate who has been uh, moved from wait list to the final list so do not lose heart even if you are wait listed there are like like live examples of stories even if you are wait listed there is a lot of chance that even at right at the end moment you might be promoted so do not lose heart abhigya would you like oh. want to just share some experience too Yes, so like uh, Sanya just mentioned, even I was uh, shortlisted, and uh, I wanted to tell people that, like, I felt my interview went terrible because, uh, uh, like, it also has to do with the politics issue, which is like I my research aligns with a very, uh, and also yes, uh, this could be an important uh, thing to remember that if you know uh, there's something going on uh, regarding your research, like I work. with the issue of pesticide use and agricultural policy and when i prepared for my interviews there was the whole thing about farm bills so they literally uh, grilled me about the farm bills and you know they wanted me to say something like <laughs> i am pro farm bills or uh, or not and but you know i had a very because i had a very analytical approach towards it and i would not say that you know Uh, I mean, I didn't want to say. Uh, so, because, I mean, I didn't mean to say that the farm bills uh, are good, and uh, I didn't say it. And I was, I like, I oppose them left, right, center. So you know, you can be political, but they would like. They really. Uh, I mean, my interview lasted a bit longer than twenty-five minutes. It almost went on till thirty, thirty-five. I'd say so, because. Uh, so yeah, in a nutshell. uh if there is something going on which is relevant to your research please do a thorough uh you know review of that because uh, even like something that was probably in the news yesterday might come back to haunt you in your interview so i think that that is a thing that i would like to add and yes like sanya said that i was uh, we, i was also on the wait list and uh, i felt that because my interview was not that great i was on the wait list but then it worked out so we yeah, are like everyone have been saying i think it's really important to hold your own uh, because it's a one year long process like for us it lasted really long because of covid mm-hmm. 
starting from July 15, 2020 till May 10th, 2021. So, yes, uh, it's a really long haul thing. But it, it really helps to have your peers around and I think, uh, yeah, that is also something I would like to say that when I started filling out the application, I had so many questions and I, I would feel very hesitant about approaching people, uh, you know, to ask very uh, trivial things, which seemed trivial to me. But then all my peers and my uh, seniors were very supportive and they answered each query of mine. And also one thing that... Uh, Although we do not need a lot of uh, paperwork from the institute, but we need a bona fide certificate. And if you are applying, uh, planning to apply this year, then please make sure that you appro approach the department through your supervisor beforehand. Like if you are applying in this cycle, do it right away because uh, the PG section loves to uh, stall things. So you need to really follow up very proactively. Uh, it's just one certificate. Uh, the bona fide and we can probably share the draft for that because it's like a basically like a simple layout where you have to just fill in your title and your supervisor's name but uh, just just to make sure that uh, the PG section or the department people do not make your life difficult on that but please you know uh, sort that out beforehand if you have decided to apply so, so I think yeah that's all from my end Thanks everyone. Thanks Sanya for actually yeah, putting this together. I just, just actually thanks Abhijit. Yeah, I just remind me of, of of a few more things which I just wanted to share. Yeah, please get the document from the institute and like you know apply as soon as possible. In my case, they almost took a month despite uh, you know my supervisor who's very good at haunting the admin anyway. But despite that, it took like at almost a month for me to get that bona fide. Um, uh, two two like very general things that start writing early your drafts that is something which helped me and if possible get someone read it for you um, because in my case like Angarika was there Angarika and Arushi Arushi Punia both of them like very generous to go through my drafts and tell me uh, how I could have uh, improved that and also one one very interesting thing that happened during my interview since there's this cultural ambassador thing for which they want you to check so there might be some random questions they will throw at you apart from your um, research so there were two questions thrown at me the first one was that uh, maybe because my area was gender etc so the main the main head of the fulbright commission i cannot recall his name he just asked me um, okay so what if you go to the us and some girl just asks you that hey you're from delhi delhi is a very you know it's not at all a safe place and i would never want to visit delhi so what, what would you like tell that person how would you convince that person to come to delhi and i just I was just uh, not expecting that question. I honestly did not know, but I can't show on this interview that I'm nervous and, you know, I can't say I don't know because that means I can't be a good cultural ambassador. So I just said that, okay, there are a lot of girl students whom I know since my bachelor bachelor's days who have actually fought with their parents and come to Delhi to, you know, study at Delhi University, IPU or, you know, those big universities and they've stayed alone. So uh, as far as safety is concerned, you go to any part of the world, you will always have to take care of certain things to be safe. But it's not the case that in Delhi you're not case because, because you know, there are a lot of girls who, whom I know personally who have traveled alone and who have stayed alone in Delhi and nothing has happened to them. So that was a very random response and I was so nervous. I was literally shivering when I was saying this because I did not know if it made sense. But that was all that came to my mind. And before ending the interview, the same person asked me, that if someone asks you, and I have asked this question to a lot of people, if I would ask you one book which I must read in order to understand Indian culture. Uh, now, number one, I do not read books a lot, especially the kind of books which will help me in understanding Indian culture. It was just so random. I just randomly said, Shashi Tharoor's I am a Hindu. I just said that randomly. I do not even know what that book is about. <laughs> I was lucky that he said, okay, since we are running out of time, short of time, we are, I'm, we are going to log off. Otherwise, I would have certainly stayed and asked you more what that book is about. So that was like, I was like saved. That was luck. But uh, you might have these random experiences, so just be prepared for these experiences. And it's okay, like, <laughs> just don't, don't panic, just be calm. You can even take some time to think, maybe, you know, take a pause. You don't have to be, like, very prompt, but then try to give uh, an answer that makes sense.
I don't, do you uh, like want to say something else? Angarika, Bhigya, Nivida, Susan, uh, then we'll just take questions from people. I, I just wanted to add to what Susan was saying that, uh, so you may get people who are from your discipline, like Susan did, and some most of the times people get, but you may not also. Mm. So uh, uh, I don't think there was anyone from economics in my panel. And actually, uh, my year, they uh, started segregating science and social science, I think, for interviews. Before that, it would be a panel which is common for social science and science. I think Nilida would have faced some, a panel probably like that. Uh, that's what I had heard from seniors. So. Uh, it would be a social science panel, but, you know, humanities and social science, but whether someone will be there from your discipline or not, it's, it's hard to say. So uh, even in the applications and when you are talking in the interview, I think it's important to speak in a language that is understandable to people outside the discipline um, in the research statement and in the interviews. Uh, you know, sometimes they will pick up things that they might so there was someone who was talk, who did ask me later on questions about econometrics and what i want to do and you know all that but the rest of the panel some of them are bureaucrats there was someone from the external affairs ministry so they don't know details of in this is in the interview the external affairs person and she did ask me questions about us india relations and how will it what you want employment growth impact that this that uh, but then if it's too technical it's hard for them to understand what we are saying so it it has to have theory i mean uh, academic rigor but also has to be a language which people can understand and which is i think what abhika was saying what is happening around you is very important uh, in the discipline so she she got questions on uh, farm bills and I work on employment and uh, labor labor laws. So I had a very clear uh, position on, you know, which is a very clear pro worker position. And uh, then they would ask me questions on that, but also on uh, current, current affairs of what is going on, what bills are coming in and all that. So that is, if there's anything happening in your discipline, then that I think is very important to know what exactly is going on in the country. Yeah. Okay. That's it. I think if people have questions, we could just, um, uh, or if you have any comments, any thoughts you would want to ask, I think we could just take them. You could just, you could just so, uh, unmute, yeah, unmute and speak. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, first of all, for putting this. I think it was very comprehensive and very useful, and it sort of, you covered everything that we, we would have to know. Uh, I had... Uh, two questions primarily. Uh, one is about the visa requirements. I think, uh, I am not sure of the other fellowships, but the Fulbright sends uh, scholars on a J-1 visa post which you cannot sort of work in the US for two years. I, I, I just wanted to know if there are some loopholes around it and people sort of relax that and ultimately go. I mean, is there a loophole around that? And my second question pertains to uh, so the research that you do at your host university with your uh, hosting supervisor or advisor, I basically wanted to know, is that a part of your thesis or is it something, it's a completely different research project that you guys are working on and uh, it's not a part of your uh, thesis at IIT. So yeah, those were my questions. Thank you. I can just answer the second part. Maybe I think Nivida and Angarika could answer the first part. So okay. I'll just answer the second part that as far as I recall, they want you to pursue some research which is related to your, like which is part of your dissertation because you are already enrolled at an Indian PhD institute and as part of your PhD studies, you want to go to the US. So how that is going to add to your PhD and how further that's going to, you know, help you gain the knowledge or skills which you are not able to gain over here. So that is what they want uh, you to work. Uh, regarding visa, you are uh, right that there's a two years home residency after uh, completion. So the J1 visa is for nine months with, with an option to extend it for one month, uh, one month grace period. So the deal is if you, once you are here, 
uh, in the US, you after and uh, you you stay for nine months or ten months, and then when you go back, that the day you go back, they start counting your home residency period. So uh, you have to be in India for uh, two years with with or without breaks. So if you are going to another country in between. That gets deducted from your two years, so you have to stay that much extra in the in India. But all this is to get another J one visa. This home residency is what I have. I was told by the uh, international programs office. But if you are planning to come to US after this on some other visa, H one B, whatever, all 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 the other visas that they have, then you can still come. But till the time you get on, I, I, I mean, there are it is possible to come. I'm not saying like uh, it's like hundred percent sure, but uh, it is possible to come for a say a postdoc on a different visa, which is not J1, uh, without completing the home residency. Uh, but if the postdoc says also on J1, then you can't you can't come within two years. Yeah. I think I was confused. So I know about the H-1B visa because that's the tourist visa, and obviously they'll not sort of ask you not to come for tourism. But I think no, no, H-1 is work. B-1 no, no. is tourism. Okay, yeah, so H-1. So H-1, I was just concerned about like the H-1 in case you wish to like go back. So I'm not sure if they allow you to work. I mean, you can go on a different visa, maybe B-1, B-2, but not H-1. I was just Not sure. No, I think if you can get a H one visa sponsored, you can you can go on that visa. Uh, oh. But you, if it's J, if it's the same visa, you have to complete the home residency. And you also like once your period here is over, you cannot uh, extend that even with another visa. You have to get back to India and then mm. come back. I maybe Nivita would be able to say. on this no i think you guys have it um okay. if you do want to go back on the j1 you can ask them sometimes i've seen them make exceptions for one or two people but don't count on it yeah 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 got it thank you so much parol you have a question Yes, yes, I did. Uh, so I wanted to know it. It's like a general thing, not just for US, but for any other uh, fellowship one might be applying. How do you kind of justify why do you want to go to that place? Like, can't isn't there a, a very obvious kind of a question that they can ask? कि ये India में नहीं कर सकते क्या? US जाने की क्या जरूरत है? So how do you kind of justify and defend? Uh, and of course, all your statement of purpose and also in the interview. technical assistance or whatever not, not, it, that it's easier for science people to justify that but even for you you can just say like why exactly why you want to go you know like better better research opportunities from from what angle you know it it does not necessarily have to be uh, so technical and like you know something very unique that's absolutely not there but it can also be that the department you are going to has a kind has a, has a special perspective has faculties who have who teach these courses and are experts in this area which you have not had in your uh, institute and uh, that is what you want to i mean th- these are things that i had said that mm-hmm. you know there are there are certain courses which are taught in umass uh, amherst economics department which are not taught anywhere in india and uh, the faculties who teach teach these courses are are would be very good advisors on my thesis so It's it's things like that. Got it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think I I could add a little to that because um, I was grilled a lot on that question. Um, for in addition to whatever Angarika said, uh, I think uh, you could say that like 
and it is true also that there are a lot of archives and a lot of uh, libraries and there are very specific um, things that are available only there like even the I, i've seen uh, through the course of my phd that there are certain books like things as you know obvious as books which are available in the us and not in india so i think uh, you got many and also like there are many networks like in my case there are many uh, organizations working specifically uh, with the question of regulation and chemicals uh, which are based in the us so uh, you can attend their conferences their events their seminars to you know engage with their work and they they do say they do ask this question now that you know can't you do that online but then you have to say that an archive is only physically present and you need to go and explore that and you need to go to such and such library so yeah uh even i Makes can sense. thank you yeah even i can add to that even i have mentioned in my application so my work is on secularism and family law reform so the us has a very specific literature on secularism which is called the first amendment and it has always been very controversial so i had mentioned that i want to be familiar with the first amendment literature and uh, and a lot of experts who have actually you know pioneered pioneered or began this field where political theorists have started studying law and religion issues has actually emerged in the usa so that was one reason that i gave the second reason i gave was that india and usa both are super diverse societies and i would want to experience a very diff- you know a, a place with that diversity and how they deal with the kind of problems that uh, you know problems of gender justice etc so those can be like very valid reasons they might keep you know repetitively asking you why 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 that was something happened with my in my interview but these are also very valid reasons and also like you know maybe there are certain workshops over there or there is some kind of moment which you want to observe over there or just you know maybe sitting in diverse c- classrooms can really add to the way you think about your own research these are like very valid reasons for you i just remembered another thing i had uh, also mentioned which is about uh, uh, cross country comparison so indian uh, universities focus mostly on india and we don't have a yes. lot of inputs from other similar countries right in terms of the research that we are doing uh, we are not taught much there are they are very superficial but us universities especially say if you want to do uh, comparisons with latin american countries which have had similar experiences as india i am talking from economics perspective parul is also pursuing economics so just uh, saying that uh, but but in any discipline if you want to do like a cross country comparison that also you can say that you us universities cover a lot more of that give you more exposure on that yes. guys i'll also add one more thing to this don't uh, think that the you are the only ones who can gain from them i also remember adding that they can benefit a lot from having a cultural perspective added to their own research mm-hmm. and that based on supposing you're already in conversation with your host university professor or other students there you can always say that this is an outcome your application is an outcome of these conversations that you've been having that can really feed into a holistic perspective sort of both ways Susan would you want to add anything I don't know how Susan left Okay uh okay next question is by Nayana Nayana please go ahead I think you're muted we can't hear you Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Um I was saying I have a fairly uh, vague and naive question. So one of the things that they look at apart from your proposal is um your academic credentials and so on, right? Whether they're good enough. And I was just wondering what constitutes uh, good enough and uh, how much of a weight it has in your application. Say for example, I've had one semester maybe in my bachelor's where my grades were the best does that make sense i i if it's a one or thing they need they'll ask you about it but i don't think they're going to i don't imagine that they are going to uh, hold that against you or really use it as something to negate everything else right. and towards this i just like to add that when you guys get your reference letters right try to have try to craft it 
with your people whoever's going to write it your academic supervisor and two other persons try to have a conversation with them about what you want each of their recommendations to say yes you don't need them to say generic things like great student diligent student like mm-hmm. whatever all the usual stuff you want them to say very specific things about you your academic supervisor should talk about your academic rigor so in my case as psychology i had a clinical psychologist who was my supervisor gave a credential that of my ethics or sensitivity towards uh, human issues or so split it tell them what you want your recommendation to say as best as possible you can't direct it but you can try because yeah. it goes in blind so you won't be able to read it before right right yeah there's this one thing which i wanted to add over here regarding um, recommended okay academic credentials i think what they are interested in knowing is rather why you are a person who is kind of you know i mean what is it what has been your trajectory that has led you to do this research i think that is one thing that they whether do you have those skills which you could you know develop later i think that is one thing and as nimita rightly pointed out the recommendation letter the fulbright actually has a form which you are supposed to send to your referees and they are supposed to fill that form which has certain things and then they are supposed to write a letter uh, what i did was i i like created a, a, a like one page pdf of uh, what the fulbright is actually looking for in a candidate and i emailed that to my uh, like referees and i told them that if you could just corroborate these and try to reflect in your reference letter that you know i kind of fit in with these criterion and i also told them that these are also a few more points and it will be go- good if you could include them now if now it's up to them how they craft it make sure you do not ask a person to write a recommendation letter they are some professors who are very busy who will ask you to frame a reference letter and then tell you that okay return it to me and they'll just say that i'll revise it but what they do is actually they just sign it and just paste it on their letter head do not fall into th- that trap because their reference letter is actually going to give a huge a very very important insight into who you are as a person so do not write to those people or do not like avoid those asking those people who would um, just want you to write the letter because ultimately the com- committee can catch that easily so do not try to do that just one thing i just yeah. ma- want to mention if people want to leave they are free to do so because it's it was supposed to be till 7:30 and you're free to stay if you want to so yeah actually i am one of those people but there are a few thoughts that i wanted to share with everyone is it okay if i just pop in yeah, for a yeah, couple sure, minutes yeah sure please do please do okay so um when in choosing your host university this is something that so uh, that i think it's a chat question and it's something i'd like to share with all of you write to a few people who you think are good fits for you uh, based on your research not based on your research when you write to them make sure it's not a blanket email i think sanya you also touched on this please engage with them on their work nothing will get their attention like you showing interest in their work and how you are yes. citing their references in your indian work yes. diversity to americans along with political correctness are very highly ranked in terms of things that they value they also want to claim that an indian fulbright scholar is attached to them their lab their team it it um not all professors but to some professors it matters especially if they are aspiring in their ranks this is something i would not have learned if had i had i just applied i learned this when i got there so uh, yeah this is like a retrospective learning so you can apply this now um not to say that you should write that horse and say to mere bina kuch nahi ho but <laughs> uh you also bring value is all i'm trying to say you have inherent value in the work that you do and in the diversity that you're going to bring to their perspective so when you're talking to them definitely allude to their work and how your work and theirs could be something that you'd want to talk to them about another couple of things i learned which are really not formal they're just things i picked up consider talking to them before saying hey will you give me this letter of support ask mm-hmm. them if you applied and got a grant what could your collaboration look like mm-hmm. they may be too busy they may be happy to engage with you on email they may be too busy to take you on as a student mm-hmm. they may have absolutely no time or they may tell you that to your face look i'll take you in i have a lab i have a team aa jao jo karna hai karo you're on your own that may also happen or they may say no we'll take the time we'll work on this project and that it we can craft ahead of time we'll write these papers together it can go any which way try and get some clarity on what they're offering you and use that according to your own priorities to see which will be your first preference fulbright by the way is pretty amazing if you put something in your as your first preference mm-hmm. 
they try to really get it for you mil jata i don't know a single person i don't know somebody here in this group who got a second preference mm. everybody i know has always gotten their first preferences the other thing is there are this is again something i learned retrospectively when you go your experience changes based on where you go i went to new york no one has the time of day for you you it is very dog eat dog you have to cut your way through yourself when but i have other friends who went to like smaller town states um sorry town based universities they had a very different experience roz raat ko kadi party ho rahi hai or you know something else is happening they can go and stay at a friend's house even before they went some indian community was hosting them beautiful things happening new york they will let you sleep on the road so i'm just saying of course not but it's much tougher it's much your stipend by the way is also decided based on the cost of living of where you go so um supposing i like my first preference was nyu my second was rutgers even just even though that's new york new jersey their neighboring my stipend my experience everything would have been completely different had i chosen rutgers over new york so um another thing you can do is look at the other sort of courses that are there uh remember that when you try to block a seat in an american university in a course it's actually very expensive for them but what you can start doing is you can start talking and seeing um other courses and start uh perhaps okay let me preface this by saying maybe not now but when you get, i don't know if we're ever going to chat again so in case you guys get it and i hope you all get it this is something you can do when you get there you can write to professors who are running those courses and say who you are and that you're there for a temporary period of time and if you wanted to attend their courses then mostly they actually allow you to just do it as an audit it's really um very fulfilling and very enriching as an experience you get a whole different educational um perspective um just trying to think if there's other stuff yeah i, I don't want to say if any one of you gets there and you're struggling with like mental health struggles or struggling to adjust just please reach back out don't feel alone you can also reach your local fulbright office you can reach your colleagues there but if it feels difficult um we're here for you just reach back out yeah thanks so much yeah thank you so much mehra that really made sense uh can i add to yeah, sure. all the questions of it uh, to nayana's question about academic credentials like uh, other said i don't think it matters a lot but if there's something on your cv which is uh, a kind of uh, which which sticks out from the story you are trying to say about yourself uh, whether it's a, it's like a course that you didn't score well or there's something there's a gap in your academic years or there's something something else which doesn't fit in have an explanation for that in a very subtle way uh, e- either in your personal statement or like you know be prepared for it in the interview so i can tell you that like i said i had a i had a very passionate story built like you know about how i want to work on employment for workers this 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 but i had a one year of corporate working experience which was not which did not fit into my story of being passionate about working for workers okay or like so uh, but but i had to find a way and i it was actually i didn't even have to find it was kind of i i had did it for a purpose but for someone who would see it on your cv it might stick out as why did you do this if this is what you wanted to pursue all, all the while but you should have some explanation for that okay and uh, another thing is uh, wait after that okay references uh, i i think this is what I, some people suggested me uh, when i was going for it like other senior full writers and i think it makes sense uh, don't go for credentials of faculties like how mm. big they are but to go for faculties who really know you well who have taught you more who know who you are as a student who will write better uh, uh, references even if they themselves are not known in the US or you know big names in the US that is okay even if they are not um then about uh, okay oh, oh, like what nivida was saying about uh, which university you go to would make a lot of difference so i i think this i told to some people who were calling uh, who are, who asked me earlier about uh, the application that in that re- uh, preference list you could think of keeping uh, 
different kinds of universities. This also I, I figured after coming here uh, in retrospect that you will probably get the first university, but there are certain things about how costly an university is, whether it's private or public, and what you can get from each university depending on that. So you can keep a mix of private and public universities in your list. So that if your first university is a private university and is very costly, so Fulbright pays pays for the for enrollment, but there is a cap on that. And private universities can sometimes have a very high en enrollment fee. So if the if the enrollment fee goes beyond the cap, then you would have to pay for it if you still want to go to that university, or you can choose another university. So if you keep, so I know some people were applying for UC Berkeley. But Berkeley was very expensive, and uh, so they wanted to shift to other other universities. Uh, also, another thing is if if you are choosing the the uh, private universities, Ivy Leagues, which ha that would have its own own sort of you know charisma with it. Uh, but it will also come with certain issues. One is the fee, most sometimes, and uh, second is it may not be that easy to sit in a lecture in private universities. So if you want to sit, because they, their courses are paid courses, they are very strict about that. If you want to audit, auditing is also paid, but say since UMass is a public university and the culture is very different, I could request faculties to sit for courses without even auditing. I'm attending their courses, I'm neither crediting nor auditing, and I can do as many of them as possible. But my friends who are in uh, other big private universities said that they could not do the same. You would have to pay and audit courses. So uh, that's something also you might want to keep in mind when you are applying because the exact course fee and, uh, oh, by the way, Fulbright, this fellowship of Fulbright is not, does not, um, uh, it does not like you know formally support uh, or taking courses so they will not pay for your courses if you are taking courses you sit through it fine but there's no like financial support for doing courses because it's a research only fellowship so you might want to keep a mix of public and private in the list so that you can you know later on uh, choose based on that um, yeah, there was something else, but now I can't. Oh, someone, some people had asked about postdoc. So uh, um, we did not apply for postdoc, so don't know exactly about the fellowship. But I knew people who have been on Fulbright faculty and uh, uh, this FNDR, the research fellowship. And there are certain things which are similar, <laughs> the cultural, cultural exchange, uh, how you will be in ambassador for for uh, cultural exchange and all that why you want to go to the us these are very common things across all uh, fulbright applications so no matter which one you are applying for mm -hmm. you will i think have to deal with this part mm -hmm. uh, rest is i think will depend on what work you are doing like the, for a postdoc it might be very similar but will obviously uh, you know, will have its own technicalities. Other than that, I don't know much about postdoc. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Is was there anything? Well, someone asked, what is the nature of engagement with host university and uh, Shaila Shri, Professor during the post? So what you can access is like I told you, courses are paid. In, in many places, so whether you get to do it or not depends on how flexible the the university is. Other than that, I, I mean, you have access to everything, basically. You work with your advisor, but you will have anything that any, uh, I mean, whatever a graduate student in the university has access to, most of that you will also have access to uh, in terms of academics. Uh, libraries, or if you are invited to a lab for lab-based research, then obviously you have that and uh, all that. Uh, Non-academic, you will not have free access to university healthcare because university healthcare is not, un so Fulbright gives a, they don't give you a health insurance, it's not an insurance really, but it's a ASPE, which is like an insurance for exchange students. 
So the ASP has uh, certain health centers affiliated to it. So even though you will be a university student, if you want to access the university healthcare, that is paid for you. But there are many health centers, uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, which are uh, affiliated to ASP, covered by ASP. So all those places will be covered by your insurance that you get. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else? Priya has a question. I think America fans have answered most of the questions over here. Priya has a question that uh, how much time does it take to prepare the application and how can you manage it with your current research work? Uh, so I'll just, okay, uh, it took me almost like two months to prepare my application. And when I'm saying two months, I mean like, you know, refining my responses actually. It took a lot of time. Uh, initially, I used to manage it with my research. I used to do like my research work first and then devote maybe say one hour on preparing my application. But as I started approaching the date of the final date of my, uh, you know, the submission, I think there are almost 10 days or maybe a week I spent just refining my responses, getting comments from people. So I think it depends upon you. I have also known people who do not spend much time preparing their application because they have already prepared uh, application for maybe you no know, other fellowships or maybe prepared for Fulbright a previous year. So they do not have much work to do. So depending upon how much work you will have to do, I think uh, it, it will uh, depend upon you. I think Angarika, maybe you could just uh, say if you would, or Abhigya or Susan, if you would want to say something. Time, I think there are two main things which take time. That is writing your research statement and the personal statement, a research proposal and uh, uh, personal statement. Uh, but the rest of it is filling a form or uh, getting all your documents and all of that. So these are two two-page documents and how much time it would take would really depend on you, you know, like it varies from person to person. But like Sanya said earlier, I think it, it makes sense to write it a little bit ahead of time and uh, send it to people who are either from your discipline or have uh, applied for fellowships before and let them edit it and give you feedback because uh, I, I benefited a lot from that i sent it out to my friends who like senior uh, friends who had more experience in research in my field so they would cut it down edit it and uh, you know give me co uh, comments on the draft so that makes it a lot more because you have a word limit have to fit in a lot of things in that in that word limit but also have to make uh, make it understandable to people outside your discipline so if someone else can read it and give you feedback that edited draft becomes a lot better from the first draft naturally so yeah I'll just That's add something on a postdoc question. Okay, so what I covered initially was actually the mission and values of uh, you know Fulbright and what is the selection criteria. And as far as I know, it's pretty much the same even for the postdoc. There might be some other specifications. For example, they might want you to know have a good publication in your area, maybe one or two. So those criterions might change. Otherwise, I think by and large, for uh, even for postdoc, these are the basic criterion. These are their missions and values, and they will. Uh, ask you uh, these questions um, there was one more question about how do you start looking for a host institute and if your supervisor connects you to someone it's a good way it is good if your supervisor connects you to someone but even if your supervisor does not connect you uh, to someone you could as I said you are reading a lot you have you know who are the people in your field by now most probably so you could just try to engage with them and write an email to them first just discussing about your work because as Nidra had said initially they are super busy and what will attract their attention the most would be somebody engaging with their work seriously because they might also be receiving a lot of emails from people who are you know just trying to contact them so just try to craft a very good email and then maybe after that you could just ask them if there is a grant and I apply would you be willing to host me at times maybe the super the person is just being retired or the person might just be on a sabbatical and would not be eligible to you know, host you. So these are certain things which uh, you should keep in mind. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, on that, Sanya, yeah. I just uh, thought of adding that, uh, you know, you can also, like when you are shortlisting faculties you want to write to, you can see if these faculties 
and these departments have been hosting Fulbright scholars mm -hmm. before. Because if they are, they have hosted uh, Fulbright scholars before, they are, they, they are very much acquainted with the whole process. Mm -hmm. They know it, they know how to write, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, letter, letter of invitation and all of that. So your life becomes a lot easier if they are used to the process. And there are, because I think Fulbright also tries to build a community everywhere mm. so you will see that there are some universities who who like you know put this up on their website and everywhere that we have so many full writers this year uh, mm. going either going to other countries from us or coming to that university from other places so those are places where you will have the least work to do mm. in terms of explaining what needs to be done and what this is all about and uh, all that and uh, also if if you can go through that process that Sanya is saying of you know building a, a, a rapport with the uh, uh, faculty, talking about academics, all that, then it's very good. Even if you can't do it, you are at the at, at a you know you have the deadline is too close to you. You can still write to them, up saying that you are you read. Obviously, you have to put that in the email that you've read their work and it's related to your research and you would want to work with them and all of that but you can write it saying that it's a it's it's about the Fulbright application if you don't have time to build that uh, because most people so Fulbright in US is much bigger than how we know Fulbright in India so everyone more or less is acquainted with the uh, somewhat acquainted with the process so obviously if you're unlucky they may not respond but if you even write if you are at the end of the application period and you just want to write to them saying that this is to request them to support your full write application you would probably get i got responses from everyone i write, wrote to about that because i was applying at the end and uh, either go positive or negative they will at least respond and say whether they can host you or they can't host you uh, most of them. Okay, I think we just need to wrap up now. Are there some final questions or comments that anyone would like to wish to uh, ask? Okay. Um, sorry. Is it allowed just to apply for more than one fellowship in a year? I don't know actually. I actually do not know. So I, I think if if you are still pursuing your PhD, the visiting researcher fellowship is the only one that you can apply for, mm -hmm. unless you are working for something uh, which is related to climate change, and you can also apply to mm -hmm. apply for the Fulbright Kalam yeah, fellowship. Okay. So Fulbright Kalam and Fulbright Nehru are the only things you can I think mm -hmm. apply while you are still pursuing PhD. Mm -hmm. Everything else is after that. Just one thing, you could just write a quick email to Pratibha Nair. She's pretty pretty prompt in responding to your queries. So if at all you have any queries like this, you could just write to her and she'll just respond to you. Is there anything else? Shri, she was asking something. Yeah, Shri, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I just wanted to know if you could also mention the links of the official website which may have some kind of information because I looked at I think the US India Education Foundation website and the information on that uh, United States India Education Foundation one and I think there's also a different website which is um, which is purely Fulbright scholar program so which is by CIES so if there is if you may know of one site or link that you can share that I think would be helpful thank you I think yeah, I've shared it. No, no. I, yeah, no, I was just saying that I think uh, while you are applying from India, the UCF site is the most useful site for you. Like, uh, not, uh, nothing else is more useful than UCF. It's only after the application you get connected to other, uh, there, there, there are places where you can get, to create your profile and the, all that will happen and those are the bigger Fulbright mm -hmm. umbrella websites but uh, at, while you are still in, in India UCF is your coordinating agency and everything will happen through UCF so they have the best information that you can ask for uh, after you if you get the fellowship and you leave and you reach India then IIE will take up 
UCF's role will be taken up by IIE and then you might need other websites. For the time being, while you are applying, I think just stick to UCF and write to Pratibha. I think we can share her email here. Yes. Uh, Pratibha coordinates the Fulbright program in India from UCF and she's very responsive and very good like in coordinating it. Mm-hmm. So any questions you have, however silly, you can write to her and she will respond with an answer. So yeah, the young yeah. Tanya has Thank you so much. Yeah, Pratibha is very, very, uh, very prompt in responding. Are there any more questions? She's taking a you? day to respond. You know, she's finding out the answer. Yes, so, yes. Because she yeah. usually responds within a day or two. Actually, yes. I was very impressed as compared to the Commonwealth Commission, which, which who are not very prompt in responding. Anything else people would want to ask or know? I think we can just wrap up. I'll just say one thing yeah. uh, th- uh, at the end that the fellowship amount will vary, like Nivida mm-hmm. said, based on where you are going. Yeah. But so you can keep that in mind when you are choosing the city. If it's a more expensive city, it will be higher. But <laughs> cost of living will go up higher than that. <laughs> Okay, so say if you are going to a big city which has the highest fellowship amount, you can think of it as the difference in fellowship will go only in rent, almost. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then with that, sometimes big cities might have like a higher cost of living. So, mm-hmm. on the other hand, obviously, you if you were in New York or you know in in, in any other big city, you will get that city life. Uh, which is very different if you are in a small town you will not get that uh, but yeah cost wise and depending on how you want to use this financially whether you want to save you want to travel you want to do anything else so i that you also can keep in mind in terms of how expensive it's going to be rent is immensely expensive yes. it is one third to half of your fellowship is rent in any mm-hmm. city okay uh, so, yeah, that's just about finance. Thanks, Anvarika. Abhigya, do you want to add something? Susan, do you want to add something? And then I'll just stop the recording and then we could just say bye. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, Sanya. Okay. Abhigya? Yeah, I think we're good for now. All right, so I'll just stop the recording. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I.